in chapter 4 is where we left off a few weeks ago. And so we're going to pick up right where we left off at the beginning of chapter 4. I'm going to do a real brief review so that we can orient ourselves to uh, where we were. It is raining cats and dogs out there right now. I hope you rolled up your windows. Did everybody roll up your windows? <laughs> if not, it's too late. All right. Um, all right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather here in your house. We don't want to take it for granted the freedom that we have to freely assemble and to worship you. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us through this book. Um, we, we obviously need your wisdom through the book of Revelation. We need you to help us understand as we unpack this together uh, what you would have us to know concerning the things that are to come. And so thank you, Lord, that you've given us a, a preview of these things. You've, you've recorded in your word these prophetic events that we might be ready, that we might be prepared, that uh, we might be right with you. And we, we think about the opportunity that we have to uh, lead others to Christ. Uh, we pray in these last days that you would give us a heart for those who don't know you and that we would be uh, good witnesses, Lord, to help others come to know the same saving grace that we do. And so uh, give us a, a passion for the unsaved and uh, help us, Lord, to live in such a way that we are eagerly awaiting your blessed return. We thank you together in Jesus' name. And the heaven said, Amen. Wow. All right. So let's go to the timeline. Let's visit what's happening here across uh, our timeline of events that uh, start with the resurrection. Can everybody hear me over the rain? Wow, that is, that's coming down hard. Um, it starts with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He then ascends into heaven after 40 days. Revelation 1, 2, and 3 talks about the church age. We've gone through that. And where we left off was chapter 4 and verse 1, which is a picture of Jesus rapturing the church. Now, what exactly is the rapture? So here's just kind of a working definition. There will be a sudden return of Christ in the clouds to physically snatch only the Christians from the earth who are still alive sometime prior to the start of the Great Tribulation so that believers will not experience the devastating things that are coming upon the earth. So starting in Revelation chapter 6, there's a, a detail of events that are going to be happening across the globe orchestrated by God as his final wake-up call to a Christ rejecting God forsaking world. So it is, it is my belief, and I'm not alone in this, that the church will be rescued, will be raptured, will be taken. Christians will be snatched from the earth prior to all that devastation that comes upon the globe. And that is what chapter four is all about because chapter four verse one says this, after these things I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. And so John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is writing that verse. And in this verse are different um, phrases and words that uh, are a parallel of other scripture verses that remind us of this doctrine of the rapture, the idea that God will snatch, will take from the earth Christians uh, as Jesus comes just in the clouds to rescue us before the tribulation comes upon the earth. And so in Revelation 4.1, John is a type, he's a figure, he's a picture of the church raptured prior to the tribulation period, which begins in chapter six. And if you, because of you know, several weeks that have gone by, I'm just gonna do a quick rapid fire. You won't have time to write these down. You can go back and watch on the archives on our teaching library. But here are the reasons why John is a picture of the church that's gonna be taken from the earth. Because in Revelation 4.1, it begins to express to us in different language this idea that the church is gonna be taken. And so the absence of the, of the word church, the word church is mentioned 19 times in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, but not again until Revelation 22:16. 16, after the tribulation is over. 
That's one reason. Number two, the open door in heaven that is mentioned there in chapter 4, verse 1. The door is standing open because the church is going up. The only other time heaven is standing open is Revelation 19, 11, when Jesus is coming down. Number three, the sound like a trumpet and like horses' hooves on the roof of the building. It mentions in chapter 4, verse 1, John said, I heard the sound like a trumpet. Well, the voice of God is like a trumpet, a sound associated with the rapture of the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, also 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Number four, the invitation to come up here, as as God says to John there in chapter 4, 1, come up here. The only other time in Revelation that God calls from heaven, come up here, concerns the resurrection and ascension of the two witnesses in Revelation 11, 12. We'll talk about that more when we get to Revelation 11. And then the last point, number five, is the return of the saints with Christ. We must be in heaven during the tribulation in order to return with Christ after the tribulation, which is what Revelation 19, Jude, verses 14 and 15, and 1 Thessalonians 3 tell us. So, those are the different reasons why when we look here in chapter 4, verse 1, that John is this picture, he's a type of the church. Again, look in your Bibles there at chapter 4, 1. He says, after these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So, again, John is an old man on the island of Patmos when he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these things, and he has visions of things concerning the future. And at this juncture here in Revelation chapter 4, the Lord takes John, um, and and this can be, you know, in, in, in a spiritual sense, but he takes him right up into heaven where in chapters 4 and 5, we are now going to see a description of things going on in heaven. When we get to chapter 6, it's going to be a description of things, events happening on earth. But for now, in chapters 4 and 5, what we're about to read is John's, uh, the the sights that that he sees, the sounds that he hears of events and things happening in heaven. So if you'll pick it up there with me in verse 2. He says, immediately I was in the Spirit. And so, by by the Spirit, he is transported. He said, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And so, the word throne is going to be a repeated word now 15 times, just between chapters 4 and 5. So, we are now having access through John to the throne room of God in heaven. And and he's going to tell us different things relative to the throne. And you're gonna notice with me different prepositions. There are actually five where he talks about on the throne, around the throne, from the throne, before the throne. So we're gonna get a grand vision and perspective of things happening in heaven around the throne of God. And what I'm gonna do with you is I'm gonna go through, we're just by check mark, we're gonna look at these different Uh, prepositional phrases that describe the throne of God. So, the first thing that he says here is, immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So, the one who is sitting on the throne is not Jesus, this is God Almighty, because we're going to see Jesus introduced to us in chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Uh, uh, sorry, chap- chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 is when uh, Jesus appears. Uh, so, th- this is not Jesus yet. This is God Almighty. This is God seated on the throne. And he's mentioned as God Almighty down in verse uh, 8. If you, if you just want to underline that, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. These, these four living creatures, which we will talk about in a moment, are ascribing this honor and worship that is due to the one who is on the throne. Well, it's the Lord God Almighty. In Hebrew, it is El Shaddai. He is the one who is seated on the throne. And so, that's the first thing that John notes with us. He said, I, I, I saw one who sat on the throne. He says in verse 3, and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. 
So uh, back there in verse three, he who sat on the throne was like a jasper, that's a reddish stone. Sardius is also a reddish stone. And so God Almighty just in this spiritual form has a, a presence of this beautiful, brilliant red like ruby. This is what John is describing here. And he also mentions that there is this uh, rainbow, that's, this is the next prepositional phrase, around the throne, there in verse, in verse 3, a rainbow around the throne, uh, and in appearance like an emerald. So, you know, try to envision this. Different artists have tried to render it, but, you know, it doesn't really do it justice until we actually are there to see this. But, but this glow of God in this beautiful jasper sardius red-like thing with a, an emerald rainbow that is around the throne. And he says in verse 4, around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. Now, who are these 24 elders? Well, this is where there's debate and speculation. Some say it represents the 12 apostles plus maybe the 12 patriarchs of the faith, which would represent the 12 tribes of Israel. That would make up the 24. That's probably unlikely because John would have been one of those, and he's not mentioning himself seating around the throne. So he sees 24 different individuals here, and they are unnamed, and we really don't know who they are. But probably the best guess is this. In 1 Chronicles chapters 24 and 25, when, when God divided the, um, the Levites in, in uh, the worship in the temple, they were divided into divisions of 24. So in 1 Chronicles 24 and 25, it says that the priests were in divisions of 24. And it says that the musicians were in divisions of 24. And so 24 is a significant number in, in the way that the priests and the musicians were divided during the, the times of the priesthood and the, and the order of the Levites. And so some say that 24 represents the nation of Israel in general. Um, others say, and this is, this is where I lean, which would include Israel insofar as uh, any Jews might believe in Jesus, is that the 24 elders represent uh, the saints. Um, Old Testament, New Testament, those who have put their faith in Christ, they are represented by these 24 elders who were seated there. And notice they're all wearing crowns. They're crowns of gold. But it's interesting to note the word crowns here in the Greek is Stephanos, which is a, like a laurel wreath kind of a crown. But when we see Jesus mentioned in chapter 19, verse 12, when he appears in chapter 19 for a second coming, he's wearing a crown, but it's a different Greek word. It is diadem. It is a royal crown. So these guys who are wearing crowns, it's an inferior crown. It's a Stephanos. It's like what Olympic athletes would get when they would be victorious in, in competition. They would get a laurel wreath of a crown. That's Stephanos. That's the word that is used here. So when you look at things like that in the original language, it helps us to understand these 24 elders, these aren't angels, these aren't, these aren't superior beings. This is a representation here. They're wearing inferior crowns on their heads, and the 24 elders probably represents the church, the completed church, uh, seated around the throne uh, there with, with the Lord God Almighty. And it says in verse 5, and here's another prepositional phrase, and from the throne, so here's the next one, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Kind of like what we had going on here a minute ago. So from the throne, that's the next phrase here that he talks about where there's lightnings and thunderings and voices. So again, this is, you know, John's senses are being bombarded here with sights and sounds. He's seeing colors. He's seeing, you know, the presence of God illuminating heaven. He is, he is hearing the sounds of like thunder and voices and, um, and he's, you know, seeing lightning. Uh, and so this is coming from the throne. So, you know, just try to imagine this again. It's a very colorful, uh, you know, scene. It's, a, it's, it's spectacular with, with lightning and the sound of thunder and voices, just all of this happening here. And in addition... 
The rest of verse 5 says, seven lamps of fire were burning, and here's the next phrase, before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So that's the next phrase, before the throne. Before the throne, uh, we see seven lamps burning, and this is probably a reference to the fullness of God's spirit. The number seven is a number in scripture for completion or perfection. And, and, uh, and he also adds in verse 6, before the throne, same prepositional phrase, there was a sea of glass like crystal, a sea of glass like crystal. Now, in the book of Revelation, when you see the word sea, it almost never means a body of water, but it means it in a figurative sense. And here's how we will sometimes use it in a figurative sense. We will talk about the ocean of humanity, the sea of humanity. That's what he sees here. And why is it like, like crystal, like glass? Because it is a picture of believers of humanity at rest in the presence of the Lord. It's very still. There's this calmness in heaven. You know, our, our world is so chaotic and there's so much noise and busyness and we're rushing here and rushing there. Won't it be good to finally get to heaven and just be at peace? Like, you're not hurried or worried. You're just like, ah, oh, we can finally just be at rest in the presence of the Lord. So that's probably what he sees here. And it's not a literal body of water. This is a sea of glass. This is, a, this is the ocean of humanity that he sees here at rest in the presence of the Lord. And in addition, rest of verse 6, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures. Now, these are kind of odd creatures here. Look at the description. Full of eyes in front and in back. You know how your mom always had like eyes in the back of her head? Well, they really did. Eyes in the front, eyes in the back. Verse 7, the first living creature was like a lion. Wasn't really a lion, like a lion. The second living creature, like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. By the way, the word holy is the only word used in triplet to describe God in the Bible. He is many things. He is just, he is loving, he is pure, he is righteous, but holy is the only word used in triplets to describe God. It is an emphasis on his holiness. Holy, holy, holy is El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. He has no beginning, he has no ending. He is the self-existent one, the eternally existing one. And so who are, or what are these four living creatures? When you look in the book of Ezekiel, and we'll not turn there, but in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel also sees uh, around the throne of God four creatures. And in the book of Ezekiel, uh, he describes these creatures as, as having the form of a man, having the feet of a calf, having the hands of a man, and each uh, creature having four faces. So, you know, we have one face going one direction, but try to imagine a creature with a face on the north, south, east, and west of your head. And that's what these creatures had. And, the, and in Ezekiel, he describes these four faces of each creature as the face of a man on one side, the face of a lion on the, on the other side, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. So it's very similar language to what John is writing here about these creatures. Uh, John says uh, the face of a lion, the face of a calf, the face of a man, and the face of an, of an eagle. And that can actually be identical to what Ezekiel sees if in fact calf, calf can mean a, 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 a baby oxen. And so if, if that's the case, calf meaning oxen rather than calf meaning cow, this is identical. These creatures that John sees to the creatures that Ezekiel sees when Ezekiel writes about them uh, in his book in chapter 10. And the only difference is that in Ezekiel's vision of these creatures, they have four wings. But in, um, in, in this um, uh, description of these living creatures, verse 8 says that they have six wings. Now, it's interesting that 
um, Ezekiel's description of these creatures are a reference to cherubim, to cherubim, angelic beings. And although Ezekiel describes those angelic beings as having four wings, otherwise they're very similar to what John says, in the book of Isaiah, we are introduced to another order of angelic beings called seraphim in Isaiah chapter 11. And in Isaiah 11, the seraphim, that order of angels, they do have six wings. And Isaiah says that when, when he sees the throne of God and he sees these creatures, uh, he sees seraphim with six wings, two they covered their eyes, uh, two they covered their feet, and the other two they flew with. So when you take together Ezekiel's v uh, vision and version of cherubim, Isaiah's vision and version of seraphim, and John's version of these creatures, um, these creatures here in Revelation chapter 4 are probably either cherubim or seraphim. These are angelic beings. And they seem a little strange to us, but, but when, you, when you put all that together, the similarity indicates that these are probably these four particular angelic beings who are around the throne and in the midst of the throne, and they're constantly moving, and they're constantly declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's their job. That's what they do for eternity. They just go around. Uh, declaring this and worshiping uh, God Almighty seated on the throne. And it says in verse 9 that whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, that's, the, that's God Almighty, here's what happens. Verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So it's a spectacular scene of, of worship, exaltation of the Lord God Almighty seated on the throne. It's a vision of sights and, and sounds and uh, these 24 elders falling down, representing the church, bowing at the, at, the, at the foot of the throne and casting their crowns, their Stephanos crowns. And so, you know, when people start talking about how there will be rewards in heaven, and yes, there will be. The Bible talks about how Jesus will reward us for our works. Works don't save us, but works will be rewarded and that we will receive a crown. There are different crowns the Bible talks about. Uh, don't think you're going to be walking around uh, comparing your crown to the crown of somebody else. Because at the end of the day, we're throwing them down. You know, we're going to be undone. There's not going to be anybody in heaven who is more concerned about themselves because we're going to be in the presence of the living God. And we're going to be undone. And we're just going to be, you know, brought to our knees. And we're going to fall on our face. And we're going to cast whatever crown we have at his feet and, and worship him. So that's this scene here that John is seeing. Now, again, I believe that this is a, an indication of how the church is going to be kept safe and this is what we're going to be seeing in heaven uh, while God unleashes tribulation upon the earth. And so John is giving this as preview. This is what heaven looks like. This is, this is what I saw. This is what I heard. All these creatures and thrones and all of this. And then, and then let's, let's tackle chapter 5 tonight as well. And he says in chapter 5, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll. So now, now listen, even though God is spirit, there's, there's some representation of, um, uh, of a physical presence because he describes here uh, a, a hand. And he's even specific, the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And in the right hand of God Almighty was a scroll written inside and on the back, which was unusual. In those days, you know, typically they would have a scroll, a, a papyrus that would be unraveled and at both ends, and scribes would write on one side of it and then roll it up and then write again, roll it up. This particular scroll has writing on both sides. So there's a lot that is going on here. There's a lot that is written on the inside and on the back, rest of verse 1, sealed with seven seals. So I want you to uh, imagine like an ancient scroll rolled up and then the way that they would keep the scroll um, preserved uh, was to attach wax seals. You know, they would, they would 
uh, melt some wax, drip it, and then they would be sealed. And so there are seven of these wax seals along this scroll. Now, again, there's been a lot of debate. What is this scroll that God is holding in his hand? And what we're going to end up seeing here is that, in effect, what it is, is the title deed to the earth. Because God the Father is about to give the title deed to the earth to Jesus Christ, the Son, to begin to do with the earth as he needs to do in order to wake up the, the final uh, inhabitants of the earth that there might be one last opportunity for them to get saved. Look, don't think that just because we are looking forward to the return of Christ and being snatched from the earth, that everybody left has no hope. Everybody left still has hope. Everybody left can still get saved. In fact, it's a unique thing that we're going to read later in the book of Revelation where God actually, to show you the lengths that he's going to go to to try to redeem the unbelievers on the earth, he actually dispatches an angel who flies around the earth proclaiming the gospel so that people will, will be able to hear it and understand it so that there, nobody will be able to say, I didn't hear, I didn't know. What about the guy on the island? The guy on the island is going to get the angel declaring it from above so that everybody has an opportunity to hear and to believe. So while we are kept safely in heaven and, and all these things are going on on earth starting in chapter 6, there is still great hope for people who are on earth. That said, they will go through some horrific things in order to get there. So I would rather be on the first flight out, okay, because the other flights are, are devastating, okay. So he, he goes on to say verse 2 here in chapter 5, then I saw, and notice he talks a lot about things that he sees, um, and he's going to also mention things that he hears in this chapter as well. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? So this one angel is just asking this question. Who is worthy to, to open this, this scroll, to undo the seals? Verse 3, and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. No one. And so, verse 4, John says, so I wept much. He weeps because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Nobody. But one of the elders said to me, that's one of the 24 elders, do not weep, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Praise God. Who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? You can make a note in the margin of your Bible, Genesis 49, verses 9 and 10. I will read it. In Genesis 49, this is a messianic prophecy concerning the line of Judah. Judah was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And in Genesis chapter 49, verses 9 and 10, it says, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. And so in Genesis chapter 49, uh, Jacob was blessing his sons, and when he comes to his son Judah, this is what he prophesies about Judah. And he says about Judah that the, that the, 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 the tribe of Judah is... Um, uh, symbolized by a lion, and that out of the tribe of Judah, not any other tribe, but out of the tribe of Judah will come one who will be, uh, who's, who, uh, from whom the scepter will never depart. So he speaks here prophetically about how Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah. Well, Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. And then here also in, in, uh, in our text in Revelation uh, 5 verse uh, six, uh, rather verse uh, five, it's a mention of the root of David. The root of David is, is out of Isaiah uh, chapter 11. 
And I'll read to you Isaiah 11, verse 10, if you want to write that in the margin of your, of your Bible. And here's what Isaiah 11:10 says. And in that day, there, sh there shall be a root of Jesse. Now remember, Jesse was the father of King David. There shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. And so it was prophesied that Messiah would not only be of the tribe of Judah, but he would also be a descendant of King David. And this idea of the root of Jesse is the idea of from the line of Jesse will come one whom the Gentiles shall seek. So even not just Jews, but Gentiles alike will seek the one who is known as the root of Jesse or here in Revelation uh, 5, the root of David, who was the son of Jesse. And John tells us that he has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Look still with me in Revelation 5, verse 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, here's our last prepositional phrase, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So here we are introduced to Jesus. He is the line of the tribe of Judah. He is the root of David, but he's also known now here as the lamb. And please note this, throughout the rest of the book of Revelation, that is the only title that will reference Jesus, the lamb. 19 times Jesus is referred to as the lamb in the book of Revelation from this point forward. It is very interesting to note because this is the most favorite title of his for himself. When we first saw a glimpse in chapter one of Revelation, John first gives us a quick, kind of just a cursory overview of a vision that he has of Jesus. And in chapter one, verses 13 to 16, he is presented in a very majestic way, very majestic. But here he is presented as the lamb, as though it had been slain. So Jesus prefers his redemptive description more than any other description. He wants to be known as the lamb. This is the one who died for the sins of the world. Why is, it, why is this important? Because remember, the only way in the Old Testament for one to have his or her sins atoned for was the presentation of a lamb as a sacrifice. And God made gracious provision because otherwise there was no way to atone for sin. God basically said an innocent animal for a guilty human life. If you present an innocent animal, I will accept that innocent animal as atonement for your guilty life. Slaughter it and the blood of that animal that was shed would um, appease the wrath of God and make temporary atonement for the sins of the people until such time that a permanent savior could die for all the sins of all people for all time and thus no more animal sacrifice. And that one is Jesus. And so as Jesus then comes and his earthly ministry begins, the first thing that Jesus does to launch his public ministry is to be water baptized by John the Baptist. What was it that John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus coming to be baptized? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John was declaring that Jesus is in fact the ultimate and perfect and eternal sacrifice once and all for the sins of the world. He is in fact that lamb of God who will die for the sins of the world. Paul will write in his letter to the Corinthians that Jesus is our Passover lamb. And so it's interesting to me that in all the titles that Jesus could have chosen to use to describe himself in the book of Revelation, the one he chooses is the lamb. It has been said that the only man-made thing in heaven are the marks of the crucifixion that Jesus will bear. Because in heaven, Jesus still retains those marks of his crucifixion. Remember, he showed, even in his glorified body, the marks of his crucifixion to his disciples. And then the next week to Thomas, who wasn't there with the first group. And he bears those marks even to this day. The only man-made thing in heaven were the marks that were done to Jesus in his crucifixion. He is the Lamb of God. And he now will use this word to describe himself because it describes the redemptive nature of our Lord. He died as a lamb and shed his blood for the sins of the world. That's the beauty of the cross. That's the beauty of salvation through faith in Jesus.
Now, he sees a lamb and it, as though it had been slain. So it's, again, it's this picture of, of our Lord as like a slain lamb. But then it's kind of an odd description having seven horns and seven eyes. So these, again, seven is a number for completion or perfection. Horns in the Old Testament were pictures of power. They were items of power. And eyes are descriptive of wisdom and knowledge. So it, it's painting a picture here of Jesus, seven horns, meaning he's all powerful, he's omnipotent. Seven eyes, meaning he is omniscient, he's all wise and all knowing. And he comes there in verse seven, and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him that is God the Father, God Almighty, who sat on the throne. Now, verse eight. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So, here, you know, here there's this, you know, stereotypical thing about, you know, people in heaven, you know, angels with harps and stuff. And it's probably actually like a zither more than, than the kind of harp we would think of. But it's a musical instrument nonetheless. And so there will be musical instruments in heaven. There is, there's still this element of worship. And, um, and so John sees here these, these four living creatures, 24 elders falling down before the Lamb, each having a harp. But I love that what else uh, verse 8 says, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. In Psalm 141, verse 2, the psalmist writes this in Psalm 141, 2, let my prayer be set before you, Lord, like incense, the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. What is beautiful about verse 8 is a reminder to us that the prayers of the saints are preserved in heaven. Every prayer that we pray is registered and recorded. It does not go unnoticed by our Lord. That the prayers of the saints are actually preserved here in golden bowls full of incense. And in the Old Testament, when the priests would light the incense and this aroma would, would rise, it is a picture of the prayers of God's people rising up to heaven. And here we find this description of this bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. If you have ever felt sometimes like your prayer's gone unanswered or your prayer doesn't seem, you know, God doesn't seem to really hear my prayers and I, I don't know if I'm going to get the answer to my prayers, please be reminded that your prayers are noted, they are heard, they are recorded. We don't always get the answer that we wish and want. But God always knows best, and we have to defer to his perfect will in loving us and caring for us. You know, I can look back at my life, and I'm thankful that he didn't answer some of my prayers the way I wanted. Anybody else? There are some things that you look at back like you really prayed for. You really prayed for it. Lord, please, please, please. And then it didn't come to pass, and a few years later, you, you're like, I'm glad he didn't answer that one. You know what I'm talking about? And so, they're recorded, and God hears them. Verse 9, and they sang... A new song. So they have the harp going and they have the, they're singing now, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll. They're worshiping Jesus, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Please note that. Every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Yes and amen. Everybody in heaven, listen, everybody in heaven is not just only going to look like you. They're not only going to talk your language. They're not going to just simply be your culture. It's going to be a diverse body of believers around the throne of Jesus from every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. At a time in our nation, and it's not unique because sadly, you know, racism and the, and the racial tension that our nation is facing and, um, you know, it's been said, I didn't make this up, you know, um, differences over skin color, it, it's really a sin issue, not a skin issue. And the Church of Jesus Christ better be the people who set the example 
of what it's like to love one another and to exemplify the love of Christ no matter what the tongue, the tribe, the nation, the people, because one day we're all gonna be together in heaven and we better start practicing how to get along now. Right? <laughs> Amen. And he says in verse 10, and have made us, he says about Jesus, you have made us kings, some translations, you might have a footnote that says kingdom, a kingdom and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Now, you know, when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom for a thousand years, the millennial kingdom, uh, saints will rule and reign with him. This is what the Bible teaches us. And when we will help discharge the, um, the responsibilities and duties of representing him as ambassadors. And so in that way, uh, we are kings and priests to serve our God. We will reign with him on the earth. Verse 11, and then I looked, more visions, and I heard more sounds, the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Okay, now he's describing, in addition to the 24 elders and the four living creatures, um, he's describing here a multitude of angels. This is probably not literal math, although I actually got out my calculator and, and multiplied. What's 10,000 times 10,000? Some of you math people can do that in your head. I can't. It's 100 million. 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million and thousands of thousands, so even more than, than 100 million. Is, is he being literal here or is he just simply saying innumerable? Probably innumerable, but probably even more than 100 million. It's just like he is just awestruck by seeing millions and millions of angels. And can you imagine now the sound, they're singing, they're saying in a loud voice, worthy, verse 12, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying. Now listen, before I even read what they're saying, did, did you catch what he said there? Every creature, every, not just every human being, every creature, every animal, every, everybody in the animal kingdom. He says, I, I'm hearing this on earth and in the sea and all that are in them. Now, I don't know, I don't know if like, you know, porpoises are going to come out and start saying, hey, hey, blessed and honor and glory and power. I don't know what this means. Porcupines, squirrels, that would be a little weird, right? Squirrels singing and talking to God. But I don't know exactly what this means. But he says every creature, everything that had breath, he hears saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Amen and amen. What a scene it is there in heaven. This is what John writes as he sees this in chapters 4 and 5. Now next week starts some really difficult passages. I'll just be honest with you. And we're heading now back to earth where John sees from kind of the, the mezzanine in heaven he sees what is happening on earth and he's going to describe it starting in chapter 6. And it is devastating the stuff that's going to come upon the earth. Now, we'll get through chapter 6 through 18. We're going to read all the devastation that God tells us in advance. And then we're going to get to chapter 19 when Jesus returns again. And then there's a new heaven and a new earth. So it gets better, all right? But there's a section starting next week in chapter 6 that starts to get heavy here. And you're going to grieve, you're going to mourn, thinking about the loss of life, the stubbornness of people who refuse to believe, stuff that's going to happen in the earth. If you think the world is chaotic and messy now, we ain't seen nothing. It's going to get super, super ugly, and uh, there are going to be cataclysmic events and natural disasters like we've never seen before, and God describes it for us, and he outlines it. Why? So we'll be ready. So be ready. Because remember, Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, even before events in chapter 6, you begin to see things that we see even now. He says, lift up your heads and look up because your redemption draws near. Amen? And we're looking forward to the redemption of Jesus Christ coming again. So we'll pick it up there next week. I'm going to let you out five minutes early. Don't ever tell me. I don't uh, be generous with you once in a while. Um, 
but I'll make up, I'll probably steal five minutes next week. But anyway, let's pray, and then you can be on your way. Lord, thank you for your word tonight. We just praise you for your word, and we thank you for John's description of heaven that reminds us of what our future home will be like, and, and just how we'll be at rest before you like a sea of glass. How there will be worship and singing, and uh, there, will, there will be people declaring just your praises, Lord, that you are worthy to receive power and glory and honor and praise from every language and tribe and tongue and people and nation. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and saving us. Thank you that you are the lamb that takes away the sins of the world, that you offered your life, you shed your blood as a sacrifice for our sins, that we might be saved. We love you and we praise you as our glorious lamb who sits upon the throne. We worship you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen.